chapter one was all about the history of personality psychology, where it started, um, where we are right now, and what the questions are that we're trying to answer. So we all know that the definition of personality is something called the psychological triad. So I went over that a little bit. And what is the psychological triad again? These are the things that make up what we consider to be personality. It's your thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviors. Those are the things that personality psychologists feel make up your, the psychological triad. And those are the things that make up your personality. And those things differ from one person to another. And so we can measure those as what we consider personality to be. Now, how do we measure those things? Well, I'm going to go over four general types of data and ways that we go about measuring personality. Okay, I'm calling these the sources of personality data, and you're going to learn these with an acronym, B-L-I-S, and that's BLIS. Okay, each one of those letters stands for a different type of data. Okay, so we're going to talk about those BLIS data types. Um, and those BLIS data types are B for behavioral data, L for life outcome data, I for informant report data, and S for self-report. So those probably sound fairly familiar to you, except maybe the life outcome, that's kind of a newer term. But I will talk about each of those in detail. I will also talk about the advantages of each of these types of data and the disadvantages. And then the bottom line to all of this is there's really no one perfect type of data. Each type of data self-reports good for reasons like, you know, nobody knows you better than you. So why don't we ask you about your personality? For example, they all have their advantages, but they also have their disadvantages too, because even for self-report, even if um, you know yourself better than anyone else, you might be likely not to share the parts of you that you don't want other people to see. And that, I mean, that makes sense. That's just part of life. So that data may not always be the most valid kind of data. Each of the four data types has its own advantages and disadvantages. So the important thing to do is to collect as many types of data as possible, and then you put them all together to get a better picture of what the person's like. And if you think back about the, uh, the elephant and the blind people metaphor, really, if you can take information from each of, for the elephant, it was each of the different people standing around the elephant, um, for personality, take information from each of the different sources of data or types of data, you're going to get a much better picture of what a person's personality is like. So that's kind of the driving point here. We're collecting these clues about what people are like all the time. Personality researchers just do it in a little bit more formal way. So coming back to the clues to personality, they all stem from the psychological triad. When we collect data, self-report data, informant report, and so on, behavioral and life outcome, we are trying to get at evidence of that psychological triad, things that they say, things that they do, and ways that they respond emotionally. Okay, how do we measure those things? As I mentioned, there are no perfect ways to measure any personality data at all. All of the BLIS, BLIS data types have their flaws, and I'm going to go through those today. But here's Funder's second law, and I know that it's in the inquisitive, but I'm not going to ask you on the mini exam whether it's Funder's second law. But I will probably ask you this, are there any perfect sources of data, personality data? And I hope you're going to say no, because every source of data has its flaws. And so what we need to do, since we don't have any perfect indicators of what a person's like, we need to collect as many of those clues, as many of those pieces of data as possible, because something beats nothing. Having some data, even if it's biased, at least we have some information about that person. What are some issues that we need to consider when we're collecting personality data, really any psychological data? One of the big ones is that measurements can be flawed. I mean, we may think that we found a friend of the person we want to know about, and they're good friends, and they're going to give us an accurate report, but they're, everyone's biased, right? We're even biased when we're answering self-report. So there, there's, again, there's no perfect source of data, and all data have their limitations. So we need to collect as much data as possible, as many of the different types as we can. Now that gets to be expensive and maybe not so practical, but if we want to have more valid research, we do need to get more data or try to get more data, as much data as possible. 
So here are the types again. B is behavioral data. L is life outcome data. I is informant report. That's friends telling, or friends or teachers or parents telling about the person you're interested in. And I will use this term that I just want you to be familiar with it. If we're wanting to get information about another person, then we can call that person the target. So you can talk about having an informant report about the target or the target person. Okay, and the last form of data is self-report. And that's just asking the person questions in an interview format or having them fill out a questionnaire, either online or paper and pencil, um, whatever's easier. Right now, everything's online. Okay, let's talk about the first one. I'll go in order of the acronym. So the first one is B data, and that's behavioral. People argue, especially the behaviorists, that really, if you really want to know what someone's like, then watch them, watch their behavior, watch how they interact, watch what they choose to do. Because really the most valid indication of what a person's like is what they do, not what they say they do or other people say they do, but what they do. So there's a good argument for behavioral data. You can collect data naturally. You can do naturalistic observation. And here's an example of um, on a subway. Let's say you were doing an observation study on a subway. You would be able to observe people in real time. You could do that by time sampling. So every five minutes, you scan the area that you're looking at, how many people are looking down, how many people are interacting. You can write it in a diary. Right now, really, since we're so technologically focused, I'm sure people do this kind of data by entering it into tablets and computers. This is what we would call naturalistic observation. There are other types of behavioral data. Here's an, another example, and pardon the low resolution of the image, but you can see, I don't know if you've ever had a child development class, but maybe you had to go and observe kids at the daycare or the child care place, and then you do your own sort of naturalistic observation. This is, looks like a class that's doing that kind of a thing. Here's an interesting thing. This is based on the research of a, I want to say Ryan Gosling, but that's not who it is. I think it's Stephen Gosling. I'm not going to ask you about him, but he's done this research and it's all about how our stuff really says a lot about our personality. The stuff that we surround ourselves with, the stuff that we choose and our environment, how we treat our stuff. So looking at these two dorm rooms, okay, there's the one on the left, which is the one with the cat poster and the one on the right. Okay. And you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, that dorm room is horrifying right? But then again, half of you may be talking about the one on the left and half of you may be talking about the one on the right. Do you think that we can say anything about the personality of the two different people who live in these dorm rooms? Do you think that this is a reflection of their personality? Uh, yeah. Possibly one is more organized, the other one is, is not as organized. And we could say this person on the right here is much more organized. I mean, you can see all the papers are neatly placed on the bulletin board and even look at the shoes there. I mean, that's like ideal neatness right there. And then when we look on this dorm on the left, we see that there's clothes everywhere and papers everywhere and things pretty much all over the place. So do you think that this is a good way to get a judge of someone's personality? Like we just walk in uninvited into their, not that we would barge in, but asked to see their dorm room without warning them, would that be a good way of knowing, let's say how organized they are or how conscientious they are? Maybe the one on the left was right before finals. And when we get really busy, guess what? Things start looking like this. Things get overwhelming, right? How many of you prefer to have your house, your dorm room, your bedroom, whatever, look like this, but when you get busy, it starts to look like the one on the left? These are hypotheses that you could come up with as a personality psychologist and say, okay, I think the more a person has their life put together, the more organized their dorm or bedroom will look. And you may find that there is a correlation between neatness of a room, a bedroom, dorm room, house, and how organized and put together and maybe mentally healthy a person is. But there might be sometimes, finals week, where even though they are pretty well put together, they may have a bedroom that looks more like this. Now, does that mean that you were wrong and your hypothesis is wrong? Not necessarily. It just means that sometimes what you think that you're observing may not actually be what you're observing. There may be other reasons for why someone's place may be very messy. 
what if the one on the right usually has a dorm room that looks like this, but guess what? Their parents were going to visit that weekend or they have a, a date coming over. Of course, they're not going to leave their, well, maybe they will, their dorm room like that, right? Really would be. So I guess my bottom line is that no source of data is perfect, even watching people in their natural environment, because you get to see what you get to see, but you have to be careful about what you assume based on your observations. So good. All right, another type of behavioral data is lab studies, going into the lab and doing any sort of a lab study. Now this could be, um, here's an example of a woman, there must be doing a developmental psych study and the baby's interacting with some sort of stimulus. In an experiment, you have a person come in, you give them a treatment or some sort of a situation, and then you record their behavior and see how they respond. You can record um, behavioral reactions, emotional reactions, that type of thing. Uh, the best thing that you can do in a lab study is to make it as realistic as possible, but that's hard sometimes because a lab is kind of a contrived setting. So that's one of the drawbacks about a, an experiment or a lab study is that, yeah, you may see a very distinctive reaction or response from certain people, but would they really respond that way in the, in the real world or the, the outside? And that speaks to the question of generalizability. Can you generalize what you find in the laboratory? outside into the real world setting. The other type of laboratory behavioral data is any sort of physiological measure. Now I'm, I'm skipping down here to the bottom. Any sort of physiological measure, the research that I have done in the past involves collecting EEG or brain activity. That is considered behavioral data. But Funder also argues that some forms of personality tests like the Rorschach, because you're actually observing their behavior and getting the, their behavioral reactions, he argues that that can be considered behavioral data too. Now, I'm not sure that I agree with him, and that was not something I was ever told to think about even when I was in graduate school, and granted, it was a while. The point is that some of these personality tests he considers to be behavioral data. Now, that's not something I'm going to ask you about either, because this is really a matter of opinion in my estimation, because not everybody agrees with him. The personality tests that he considers to be behavioral um, or give you a behavioral response are those that are projective. We're going to talk about the differences between personality tests next chapter, chapter three. So that's all I'll say. But definitely physiological measures, MRI, EEG, any sort of um, skin response, you know, the sweat response, those are all considered behavioral data. Okay, what are some advantages of behavioral data? I've mentioned a couple of these already, but um, in a lab study, you can control the setting to be really whatever you want it to be, and you can observe the reaction of the individual to, uh, to specific stimuli. Now, you, in the natural setting, you kind of have to be you kind of have to wait and see what kind of stimuli the person responds to. You don't have control, right, when it's a naturalistic setting. Um, but in a lab, you have more control of variables, and so it makes it seem like it's more objective what you're studying. And you can have greater reliability and precision in a lab study because you can control the variables that the person has to respond to. In naturalistic or participant observation, the difference between naturalistic observation and participant is that a participant actually becomes part of the setting and is there long enough that other people that they are observing don't even notice them after a while. Um, one of the things that you don't have to deal with with behavioral data usually is response bias. People saying or doing things because they know you're watching and they want to look good. You can also observe people as they normally interact they're in their daily lives with naturalistic observation. And it tends to be more realistic because it's not some contrived lab setting. What are some disadvantages though? Okay, in a lab, it's very contrived. And honestly, when I hook people up to EEG, it's weird, right? Because you're sitting there and you have all these wires attached, all these little electrodes attached to your head and wires coming out and they go to this electrical box. And I can imagine it'd be kind of scary. And in fact, when I was a graduate student, I remember one student coming in, I have to use a syringe. It doesn't have a sharp needle or anything. It just has a really like a metal tip to be able to put gel in each of the electrodes. I had a student come in and be a part of my study. And as soon as I pulled the syringe out, he fell to the floor and 
um, fainted. So I had to call the ambulance. But so, I mean, it's a contrived, maybe anxiety producing setting sometimes in the lab. And you have generalizability issues, right? What you may observe in the lab may not be the way the person would react in real life. And I mentioned that as generalizability. We can also talk about that as being external validity. So just kind of jogging your memory back to research methods, 144. External validity is the, the extent to which whatever you see in the lab, whatever you observe as your result in the lab is the same as if that person were interacting with that stimulus, whatever it is that you're um, showing them in the real world. Would they respond the same way as in the lab? That's something that, you know, it's kind of in question sometimes when you have a really contrived and controlled lab study. Some disadvantages of naturalistic or participant observation are that um, it's time consuming. I don't know if you've ever done any behavioral observation, but you have to wait and, and observe it over a certain amount of time and then hope that you see what you hope you see and then you have to code the data. And usually it's so time consuming, you don't get a lot of participants and that's what we're referring to with small n. You can have a small number of participants because you can observe how people interact at the mall all day, but you might not see, maybe you're looking for aggressive interaction. You might not see people aggressively interacting at the mall, particularly right now, you wouldn't see that because I don't even know if the mall's open, but um, you've kind of you kind of dependent on what interactions people engage in because you're in the natural world and the natural setting. And what is aggressive behavior? Well, that's something that the, the observer is going to have to decide. So there's some subjectivity there to figure out whether what they're seeing is actually aggressive behavior or not, if that's what they're looking for. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, you've got these weird things that happen in the lab and we really don't know if that's the way they really would respond in the outside world. Okay, so that finishes behavioral data. Let's go to L data or life outcome data. And I'm noticing here that my picture of my fake police record here is covering up the end of the life outcome data. But life outcome data is really, it's the residue that you leave behind in the world. And to be true life outcome data, it has to be objective. It has to be recorded not by you, but by somebody else, like your school or your government or your police department or that type of thing. So examples of life outcome data would be a police report, volunteer hours, the number of volunteer hours that you've engaged in, your GPA, your transcripts. Those are all examples of life outcome data. Okay, so again, this is the residue of your personality. And to be truly life outcome data, it has to be recorded or noted by someone other than you. And this is why if we think of social media, it is sort of the residue that we leave behind, but you could also argue that it's self-report, right? Because you are influencing what you put online. And also someone could argue, well, it's behavioral because it's your behavior. We're observing the behavior of you posting things online. And, and that brings up a point I want to make too, is that not every type of data that you can collect fits neatly into one of these four types. There's some that don't fit into these four types. But I just want to also reiterate, even though I mentioned social media as sort of life outcome data, if it were really truly life outcome data, it has to be objectively recorded by someone else, not by you. So speeding tickets, medical records, IRS records, those are all examples of life outcome data. So here's some more report cards, criminal reports. Uh, there's lots of sources of life outcome data, but remember they have to be recorded by someone other than the target or the person you want to know about. What are some advantages of this type of data? Well, there are definitely advantages. And one of them is that it's objective, right? It's recorded by somebody else, like a government institution or a school. And so it's verifiable. You can be sure that the data that you see, life outcome data, actually is the product of the target person's behavior. And also, it's, it can be intrinsically important. So if you want to know how generous a person is, then if you look at their volunteer contributions, that's probably going to be, in most cases, a genuine reflection of how generous they are, right? So it's intrinsically important because it gets at the very thing that you're wanting to know about that person. And because of that, it's also relevant to them psychologically. But there are some disadvantages to this. One of them is this thing called multi-determination. You'll see this in the textbook, multi-determination. What does that mean? Okay, well, that means that, yes, you may have this objectively verifiable 
psychologically important data that may tell you how generous a person is, but is it really telling you how generous that person is? Or was there some other reason why they gave all that money that year? Maybe they were given an incentive by somebody else that if you donate a certain amount of money to this charity, then you get to have this all expenses paid trip to Vegas or something. There could be other reasons for why a person has this objectively recorded record. Let's take a report card, for example. Um, hopefully your professors were understanding and compassionate and worked, you all worked together in the spring. But um, I've heard of some professors in other departments that um, they weren't very understanding of the whole study at home thing. And they thought, well, if you don't have to come to school, you're gonna have more time to do homework. So they actually assigned more homework and more responsibility on students. And I know stu students who were still able to work, you only have a certain amount of hours in the day to do your job and to do school. And so the GPA of stu some students um, really suffered. Now, does that mean that they're not really that great of students? Well, it, so if I solicited their report card from that time period and I was relating, let's say, GPA to how conscientious they are, it could be that their GPA dropped as a result of all these other things that were going on and their level of conscientiousness didn't really change. In fact, maybe it even got stronger because they knew they had to force themselves to do the things that they needed to do. So the report card in that case is not only determined by how conscientious a person is, but it's multiply determined by these other things like the pandemic factor and professors assigning more work than they should have and so on. So you may have this great objective, verifiable piece of data that speaks to the thing that you wanna know, how conscientious or how bright is a person, but the record that you see may be determined by other things as well. Okay, so multi-determination, there's other reasons why people may have this life outcome data that really isn't a good reflection of them. Okay, here's something interesting too, speaking of social media data, I'm not going to click on this and have you guys watch it, but I encourage you, if you get a chance when you're going through the PowerPoints, just watch this. It's very trippy. It's really talking about how all of our social media data that we've put out there on all the different platforms, people can collect those and they can put them together and they can sort of reassemble a hologram of you. And based on your reactions online, they can have that hologram respond after you're dead, the way that you would respond if you were living. And that's really trippy. So just something to think about, make sure you keep track of the stuff that you're putting out there. Is that who you want to represent you when you're no longer in this world, because that is a definite possibility. Okay, let's move on to that type of data where you ask some person, a friend or a teacher or a, you know, a, maybe a boss, coworker, ask somebody about the target. You, you can find out information about what that target's like from asking people that know them. These are called informant reports. So you typically wanna pick somebody who knows that person fairly well and that can include all of these types of people. Someone can ask your children about you, they can ask your friends, your roommates, your spouses, your parents, your coworkers, and so on. Those are all informant report data. And you can get a lot of information about somebody from doing this. And it's fairly easy to get because all you have to do is interview them or give them a questionnaire online or with paper and pencil. But the definition then is that these are judgments about a target person from informants or people that know that person, knowledgeable informants. Okay, and you can ask them about that person's personality and their behavior and really the psychological triad, right? The way that they think, feel, and behave. Okay. Here's the thing though that you need to consider. You can ask somebody who knows that person really well, but just remember that they may know that person really well, but only in a certain context. And I don't think it's realistic to think that the person you are, say online in Zoom, in Zoom is the same person you are at, let's say at a football game or at a nightclub or a dance club or at church. You probably, like most people, modify your behavior for those different settings. And if somebody only knows you from one of those settings, they're gonna give a report about you that is really only based on how you act in that setting. So context is really important. And when you get an informant, you would preferably like to get an informant that has seen that person in multiple contexts. Nonetheless, this is used quite a bit in research. And also, if you're going to be a clinician, maybe one of you wants to be a school psychologist, you're going to use these a lot because you're going to have behavioral reports that you send home with a child.
child who needs an intervention or who needs an assessment actually and may need an intervention and you want to find out what they're like from their teachers and you want to find out what they're like from their parents and then you might want to ask them themselves but that's self-report data so these are frequently used maybe you've had to take them as part of a doctor's visit for your children or your partner or your spouse the thing about these is what you're really asking the informant about is your reputation. What is your reputation with each, with each of these people? Your reputation with your teachers and your professors and maybe, I don't know, whatever religious person that you know, a priest, pastor, or uh, any of those people, the, your reputation with them might be very different than your reputation with your friends. So again, when we're talking about informant reports, we're really getting a sense of what your reputation is like with whoever it is that we're asking. So these can be great. These, some of the advantages are that they can be pretty valid, right? Because you're asking people that know you fairly well, or you hope that the person who you want to know about is going to give you names of people that know them pretty well. And you can combine multiple informant reports to get a better idea of what somebody's like. And it can be based on a lot of information, okay? You can get someone who knows that person from a religious context and a fun night dance club context and maybe someone from school and for someone from work, okay? So they're based on real observations of your behavior or a person's behavior and, and that makes them a really great source of information. But there are some drawbacks too and those really stem a lot from are you asking the information about your target from someone who knows that person really, really well, or someone who knows that person only in one context or a limited context, or maybe even just a limited amount of time. So if you ask a coworker, you're gonna get good information probably about them at work, but what are they like at home? What are they like you know, when they're out having fun? Another problem is that even though you may have friends who think they know you pretty well, or teachers or whoever that know you pretty well, they really don't know what's going on in your head. They may think they do, they may say they do, but nobody has access to what a target person is really like other than that target person, right? Because we can't mind read, and so you, can't, you don't have access to like the true valid personality characteristics of that person. Also, and this is something that's really important to think about, what we tend to do if, if we're asked, if someone were to ask me, can you please fill out a report of your friend? Um, my best friend lives in Chicago now. Her name's Jen. And I've known her for many years. But what I'm probably going to think of first, and this is what tends to happen, is that you think of highly emotionally salient things. When you're trying to judge a person, um, you think of things that really kind of stick with you. And the memories that really stick with you are the ones that are really positive or really negative. Because our brain does that, right? It prioritizes the things that were really great that you want to remember and the things that were not so great that you want to remember about that person so that you don't experience them again. Okay. So what you're going to end up doing is giving an informant report about the target person that's based on largely on those highly salient experiences because that's what you remember. So here's a little life hack. Let's say you have a, a new partner or boyfriend or girlfriend and it's getting more serious and finally you've decided you're going to meet their parents. Here's something that you might want to do. Try and figure out something really positive, really emotionally salient and positive to do. Like bring a bouquet of flowers for the parents or something like that because when they think of you in the future they're gonna think oh yeah we like her we like him they gave us a bouquet of flowers i mean what a great person you're going to think of those highly emotionally salient things something to remember on the flip side though is that make sure you don't do anything that's really emotionally negatively salient because guess what that's what they're going to remember okay so just something to think about Next time you have to make a really good impression on somebody, do something that is really positive, and that's what they will tend to remember, that very positive thing. Um, what are some biases that people have when they're doing informant reports? Well, when you're asking parents about their kids, one of the things that you may find is that they're going to just naturally compare the child that you're asking about to their other children. And if their children are very, very different, which usually siblings are very, very different, then you're gonna get this contrast effect where the target child is either gonna look a lot more positive than they really are, or even a lot more negative. Let's say their older brother or sister is like the valedictorian perfect child. And even though they're a pretty good student, they're not the valedictorian perfect child. So they're gonna look more negative than, they, than if you were to ask someone who wasn't their parent. So that's the sibling contrast effect. Letter of recommendation effect, that's another issue. If you 
are asked, tell me the names of three people that know you pretty well who could talk about what your personality is like, you're not going to list your enemies, right? You're going to list people that know you well, but also like you. And that's another source of bias. You're going to get more positive ratings of somebody when you ask them to give you names because they're not going to give you names of people who don't like them. And then the last thing is that there's also this time dependency here that let's say you're investigating relationships and you want to know about the personality of a person's partner and what they think about your target. Um, if they're newly in a relationship and they haven't known them very long, they're going to probably report them as being much more positive than they normally would. Because when you're in love, like even the person picking their nose, you think, oh, that's kind of cute. You know, it doesn't bother me. But then later on, you're like, oh my gosh, what am I, what am I doing? If anyone's ever been in love and has had that experience, then you know what I'm talking about. But if you haven't, then it's coming. <laughs> okay. There are differences between what we think of ourselves and what other people are, think of ourselves. And it ten, the research tends to show that other people tend to think more highly of us than we do. And that, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe that makes us humble. Um, but there are differences. So there about there are differences between informant reports and self reports. You know, if you were to ask the person what's your personality like versus asking the informant what their personality is like, um, usually the ratings of personality are going to be more positive by the informant than the self. Okay, I'm going to skip over all of that. That's a lot of text, not that relevant. So going to the next slide and the last type of data, which is self report. Okay, self-report data, you're probably pretty familiar with these. Self-report data is the definition of your own personality. If I were to ask you to give me a report of your personality, which I will be asking you in some of the assignments, what you tell me is your self-report. It's the report of yourself, okay? And usually this is done with questionnaires or surveys. Sometimes it's done in interviews. That's a little more time-consuming way of collecting the data, but it is done in interviews, particularly in clinical psychology research. This is by and far the most common way we collect data about personality. And probably that's because you can get a whole bunch of information about people in a really short amount of time with self-report. You don't have to track down informants. You don't have to go watch people doing what they're doing in their daily lives. And you can get self-report data from many people at the same time, whereas observational data you're going to have it's going to be time consuming because you're going to be watching each person you know over an extended period of time and if you even for life outcome data self-report data is much easier and less expensive because you don't have to go track down all of those government records you just ask a person you can take the big five assessment and in 15 to 20 minutes know exactly what your big five traits are much faster than any other source of data and so most research and personality has been based on self-report which is good and bad, right? We've been able to find out a lot of information about personality over the years, but it's bad because there's a lot of bias that's inherent in self-reporting. I mean, we're gonna report that we're our best possible selves, right? And we don't wanna report information that people don't like. Information that we think somebody might not like about ourselves, we tend to make more positive, okay? And doing that is a source of bias called social desirability bias. And I'm sure it's on a slide in the future, but I just want to introduce that term. Social desirability is a bias that happens when a person presents information about themselves, or it could be informant report, another, another person that's just a little bit more positive than, or a lot more positive than they really are, because they know that the, who they really are, if they were to tell the truth, it really wouldn't be socially desirable. So that does bias the, the things that we tell each other about ourselves. Okay, um, one of the things about self-report data is that we can say that it has high face validity. And face validity is what we call data, or if we were to talk about a highly face valid questionnaire, that means um, that if I were to just look at the questions on the questionnaire and try and figure out what the, que the whole questionnaire is measuring, say I don't know what trait it's measuring, I could figure that out just by the questions because the questions are asking things that you would think are kind of logically related. So for example, if I got a questionnaire and question number one is, um, I like to go out to parties frequently and you can rate that on a scale of, you know, zero to never true about me all the way to 10, very true about me. Number two might be, um, I like to have many friends. 
Number three might be, um, I tend to like to go out more than stay in. What do you think that questionnaire, just by hearing the questions, what might it be measuring? Extroversion or being an extrovert, sociability. So those are highly face valid questions and those are what you tend to get when you're getting self-report data. Those are the kinds of questionnaires that self-report data come from, those with high face validity. Okay, what are some advantages? Nobody knows more about you than you. So you have a lot of information to draw on, unless you have a memory problem or, you know, amnesia. You're always with yourself. You know what you're like in every context, okay? Not just at work, not just at home, not just in class or at church or synagogue or temple or whatever. Um, and you're the expert about you. No one else, even if your mom says, oh, I know you better than, you know, moms say stuff like that sometimes. You are the expert. Nobody knows what's going on in your head, okay? Because you have access to your own thoughts, feelings, and intentions. Um, people can watch your behaviors and maybe, you know, attribute certain uh, traits to your behavior, but you know why you engage in certain behaviors because you have access to your mind. Another advantage, like I said, with, with self-report data or S data is that um, it's super easy to collect. Just give somebody a questionnaire and a couple minutes, you have a lot of information about them. It's cost effective too. It's much cheaper than observing individuals. It's much cheaper than bringing them into a lab and going through the whole lab experiment. It's much cheaper than trying to track down police records or tax records. I mean, that you have to pay people to do that and it takes time. It's really cost effective just to have somebody figure out or write down what they think about themselves or, or answer a questionnaire. And it has something called definitional truth because, and what that means, and it's a little slippery concept, I think that Funder talks about, but um, when I ask, if I were to ask you, what's your personality like? Well, we all have our own definitions of what our personality is and our personality is defined by who we are. So when I tell you what my personality is like, it's, I'm telling you my own definition of who I am. So Funder calls that definitional truth. Again, nobody knows you like you know you. Now, whether you're willing to tell everybody the, about the real you is another question, right? Because there may be reasons why you don't want to tell people things. Um, and one of those reasons is maybe what they're asking about is something that if you told them the truth, then it, it might make you look bad, right? Because it might be not socially desirable. So social desirability is an issue. Sometimes people can't tell you things because maybe they have memory problems or maybe they just have chosen to be in denial about something and they don't really have access to whatever it is you're asking about. Another reason is the fish and water effect. And what this is referring to is the fact that if you were to ask a fish, hey, are you wet? A fish will not know what you're talking about because the fish swims in the water. And so that's just so much of their, all, their whole daily life that they don't see that water as being wet. Now, what's an example of this if you're not a fish? Some people don't have that insight. They grow up in a setting where they may be very loud or they may be very quiet and they don't know that they're different from the outside world because they only compare themselves to what they know. And that is sometimes a bias. That, um, that people have when they're filling out questionnaires or talking about themselves. Okay, um, also another reason somebody might not be able to tell you the truth or won't tell you the truth is because they have, like I said, they're in denial or they distorted their memory about something or they just refuse to see themselves in a way that they don't think is favorable. Maybe you're asking about something like um, underage drinking and they think, well, it's okay because, you know, my parents do it. They let me drink at home, which if, if we're in our own house, then, you know, I don't, I don't mind. I don't think that I have a problem and maybe they get drunk all the time. So maybe it is a kind of a problem, but they don't see that because it's, you know, something that happens in their home. Or maybe they drink so much that they can't remember. Okay. That's a, um, a problem with limitations of memory. Or they just, ref maybe the, here's another thing has nothing to do with drinking, but um, maybe there's something that was true about them in the past and they don't want to remember who they are, who that part of them is. And so they just kind of change their memory so they, they don't have to remember who they were. So you can distort your memory in such a way that you can't really report honestly about yourself because you just completely distorted that memory of who you are. And then there's some people who 
they just don't have insight. I think it can be argued that there are people who, who probably qualify as having narcissistic personality disorder, that um, they may think that they are totally empathetic or empathic about other people and they care very deeply about people. But the truth is, people who, are, who qualify as having narcissistic personality disorder, they are not capable of being empathic. They just don't realize that they are not being empathic because they don't know what that's like. Right. So some people just have a lack of self insight. And so you can get their most honest, accurate report of who they are, but they're really not going to know who they are because that's not, they're not capable of having that insight about themselves. Other people argue that self report data are not great because everybody can do it. Everybody overuses it. Um, we need to use other kinds of data and not just rely on self report data. And that is definitely true because most of the papers in personality research up until I would say about 20 years ago, they were almost totally reliant on self report data. And because we have all these problems, these disadvantages of self report data, then we can't be so sure as we have been in the past that everything everyone reports about themselves is totally accurate. Okay, so sometimes maybe it is too simple and too easy. Also, I know that's really fine print at the bottom, but one of the things that happens with both self-report and also informant report data is that sometimes questions can be worded in such a way that they're really confusing or they're double-barreled. Double-barreled is when you're actually agreeing to two different things in the same question where you may agree with one and not another. So there's issues with the way questions are constructed. And so that's kind of the main point here. You need to consider that sometimes the way the questions are worded for informant report and self-report can be confusing and misleading. Okay, as I mentioned before, and the example was with social media data, there's some data that can't fit clearly into one of the four categories, behavioral, life outcome, informant report, or self-report. Some can pull from each of those. So what you post on Instagram may be partially a reflection of of you, who you are because you posted it. But also you can say that that's behavioral data because if you look, you can see how many times people post, what kinds of things that they post. Do they post mostly things like food or people or landscapes or are they trying to show you all the places they've been on their vacation? And some of it, someone might argue, well, I don't think you could argue really that clearly that it's life outcome because it's not objective. They're actually posting it. But um, social media can be considered both self-report and behavioral. And there are other sources of data that are like that. And so some sources of data don't fit into only that one category. And there are sources of data that we haven't even talked about because they don't clearly fit into those categories. But the main thing is I want you to be able to recognize those four main types of data know what's good about them, know what's bad about them, the things that we have to be concerned with when we're using that type of data. And that uh, we also have to understand that none of them are perfect and we have to collect as many as we possibly can because each source of data is only a clue about that person. And if you really wanna get a sense of what someone's personality is like, you have to collect as many clues as possible. The more you can find clues that are consistent, self-report, an informant report, some sort of a behavioral observation and a life outcome piece of data that supports the idea that, hey, this person's a really conscientious person. If you've got four sources of data that are confirming that, then you're going to have much more confidence that those data are valid. But also what's interesting is if you have different clues, different sources of data that may be discrepant. Or one source of data, maybe an informant report would say this person is really, really sociable, whereas the person would self-report that they're not that sociable. And you see this difference in the description of their personality, and it may indicate that that person maybe is someone who really modifies their behavior to fit a setting. If you were asking um, a coworker as the informant report, how sociable is this person? And the target person has a job where they have to interact with people every day and be pleasant and outgoing and make small talk. Even if they're an introvert for that job, they're going to act like sociable extroverts, right? Because that's what's required. But if you ask them what they're truly like, they'll report, you know, I really, I'm kind of an introvert. I like to not be around a lot of people. 
So those discrepancies can give you more information about that person. And you might know, hey, they're really able to modify their behavior to put on, you know, this personality when they need to do it for the job. So discrepancies can be really interesting and informative too. Okay, so Funder says there's only two kinds of data. Terrible data, which unfortunately all of the data has its problems, all of those four sources. But even with their problems, they're better than no data. There are things that um, people might not want to admit about themselves, right? Because like selfishness or vulnerability or narcissism. And the reason why is because we seem to have this idea in our head of like what a good personality is, what a personality that is socially desirable is like. And so when parts of ourselves don't ma match up to that socially desirable level, that's when you see that bias that people will try to say things to make themselves look better than they truly are because they don't want to look bad in society. 